Okay, so hello everyone. So welcome to our this week Rutgers Efficient AI seminar, and uh, we're very glad to have Professor Karim uh, Kamsari from the UC San Barbara to give us this talk. And uh, Karim is currently assistant professor at the Department of the Electrical and Computer Engineering at the UC San Barbara, and he has PhD work established a modular approach to connect a growing set of the emerging materials and the phenomenon to circuits and system, a framework adopted by others in later works. He used his approach to establish the concept of P-bits and the P-circuits as a bridge between the classical and the quantum circuits to design efficient domain-specific hardware accelerators for the beyond more area of the electronics. He's a founding member of the, the Technical Committee on Quantum Neuromorphic and Unconventional Computing within the Attribute Nanotechnology Council, where he currently leads the Unconventional Computing section. He has received the Attribute Magnetic Society Early Career Award, a Bell's Labs Prize, the ONR Young Investor Award, and NSF Career Award for his excellent work on the probabilistic computing. He's a senior member of the IEEE. So now let's welcome Professor Kamasari to give us this talk. Thank you, Bo, for this introduction and uh, for the invitation to a distinguished uh, AI seminar series. I've seen past speakers, and I'm uh, really glad to be here. And um, once again, um, I, yeah, thank thank you very much. So um, uh, today, I like to talk about uh, uh, about this field that you know this probabilistic computing with with what I call p bits, and I'll try to tell you, give you a flavor of how it's um, uh, related to combinatorial optimization, machine learning, and even things like quantum simulation. So um, before I begin, it would be, let me create a laser pointer here to, okay. So uh, before I begin, it, it's it's a great uh, pleasure to um, uh, acknowledge my collaborators and my team. I work with, you know, I start, we started this with Professor Supriyo Dara at Purdue University and longtime collaborator and uh, um, and um, Professor Shunsuke Fukami, Professor Hideo Ono, Professor Shun Kanai. So these are my uh, Japanese collaborators um, and uh, from Tohoku University. And um, th they they have been instrumental in, in helping us um, creating these experimental demonstrations, some of which I'll share with you in, on these emerging technologies. I also work with Professor Giovanni Finocchio and, and his his team, and uh, I have a wonderful set of um, uh, graduate students who uh, I, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with. Okay, um, so let's jump right in. And, you know, so we, we're all familiar with the idea of a bit. Okay, so that powers basically everything around us, right? And the bit is this object that is either zero or one. And we have, as bit is an abstraction, but we realize these bits in our uh, chips that are you know, that have now I, I don't know the latest number, but hundreds of billions of transistors, right? So this is basically this basically what enables much of our modern life, right? So now on the other end of the spectrum, one could argue is the qubit or the quantum bit, and unlike the bit that is always zero or one, as we learn in Boolean logic, this this qubit is a strange thing, which is this superposition of zero and one. And what is superposition? I mean, that even, even discussing that requires some discussion, not very obvious, right? And it is anticipated that it is, it is argued that the qubit will be useful for a lot of applications in you know, domain specific applications in the future. And many companies and entities and academia, they're trying to uh, build these quantum computers. And they, they're, you know, they're tremendously challenging uh, the, the task of building these quantum computers. Now, qubit is something that is in between. You know, something that is not quantum mechanical in the sense that it is not phase coherent. It's not like there is no wave function and things like that, but it, it fluctuates between zero and one. It isn't entirely classical either because it's not deterministic. It's, it's this thing that will fluctuate between logic zero and logic one. And it is really in between these these two things because you know as as most of you as all of you know in, in elementary quantum mechanics 
quantum is phase coherent, but it's also probabilistic, right? So you have to become probabilistic because before you become quantum mechanical. Now, everything I'll tell you with p-bits, it's also domain specific. It is ju just like, you know, for, for qubits, for example, people often say that it's not going to replace, it's not expected to replace anything that we do with, with anything we, we do efficiently with bits, but maybe you know, niche applications like simulating quantum mechanics. Okay, so that that's, for example, one, one very big area. So p-bits also are domain specific. I'll show you that things that are naturally probabilistic, if you have a probabilistic algorithm, if you're doing probabilistic machine learning or AI, p-bits seem to be a good, good fit for those types of problems. And so it fits to machine learning. Now, this it is surprising, but it also overlaps a lot of applications anticipated from this quantum computers. And you know they, they're now talking about this noisy intermediate scale kind of not, not quite fault tolerant, but um, NISC era quantum computers. We see a lot of overlap and we think that, you know, if a room temperature object like the PBIT could could do some of those things very efficiently as well, perhaps perhaps better because of those advantages. So what what do you do with PBITs? Show us some applications. Well, um, first of all, you know, in machine learning, there is this idea of sometimes you need you need and in other fields, you need a lot of random numbers, a massively parallel to random number generation. And when I say a lot of random numbers, I think a trillion numbers in a few seconds, for example. So when I say this, people say that, yeah, I mean, I can get random numbers from Python or or or, or uh, MATLAB or whatever, but I'm talking about, can you get a trillion numbers, new random numbers in a few seconds? That, that's Those are the scales we're talking about. And in machine learning, there is this uh, large area that w w was very popular just before the ImageNet moment of deep learning, right? This energy-based models. And these energy-based models are probabilistic and they have probabilistic building blocks. So you PBIT fit very well uh, uh, to those to those models. Okay, especially things like belief networks, Boltzmann machines, or um, energy-based modern and old Hopfield neurons and Hopfield networks and things like that. Okay. And um, so that's one big area that, that PBITs apply naturally. And the other is combinatorial optimization. You know, these are these computationally hard problems where you try to solve some problem in NP. <clears throat> For example, the traveling salesperson problem or the max cut problem or factorization. And the usual idea is, in, is, is inspired from physics. And the idea is that you have a complicated and rugged energy landscape and you're trying to get this blue ball to one of these, you know, one of the lowest energy minima or the ground state, and th that would be your solution. And it's up to the algorithm designer to find a way to wade through the space. Now, um, why does PBIT apply naturally to this? Okay, in the case of random number generation or energy-based models where there's probability we can understand this, why is there a PBIT connection? Well, because these problems often have very efficient probabilistic algorithms. And one idea that most of you have heard is that if you're stuck in a local minima, for example, you can add some noise and you can jump over barriers. So it's a stochastic move, but it can help you overcome this difficulty, okay? So that's why p-bits make, make, make it, it become a nice fit to such models. Now, um, the other thing that is kind of underappreciated in this field, but it's gaining more attention, is quantum simulation. Now, people think of quantum as some completely different computational problem. That oh, if it is quantum, there should be it's it should be entirely different. Now, that's not true. Okay, if you look at the computational algorithms or the computation itself, you'll see that in many cases it is not clear where the distinction is, when you need the phase coherence. There are problems where you need the phase coherence very, very clearly. For example, random circuit sampling, if you know what that is. Then you, you need the quantum computer very badly, but there are other cases like quantum Monte Carlo or, or certain systems where it's not clear whether um, you, you actually can get away with 
uh, it's unclear whether you couldn't do the same computation with something like a PBIT network. And this quantum Monte Carlo is an old field, but it is most often performed in software. Now, one of our ideas is why don't we build hardware uh, uh, setting, you know, start from the ground up with PBIT and try to solve this quantum Monte Carlo problem. And the ideas are really interesting. You take a qubit network and you replicate it with PBITs and that somehow maps to certain properties, uh, statistical mechanics of those quantum systems. So this is an old field. And that, that has a very good PBIT mapping. We've done, we've implemented this in FPGAs, in, in theory, in practice. So, so that's that's kind of very exciting. Now, another recent phenomenon is, you know how people say machine learning is eating the world, right? It's eating everything in all these applications. So recently people applied machine learning to model quantum systems. How does this work? Well, the idea is something like this. If you have a quantum system, quantum or probabilistic, finally, you're trying to get the probability distribution. Because as you know, you know, wave function, soon as wave function, the only way we interact with the wave function is to measure it. And when you're measuring it, you're measuring a probability distribution. So a recent idea was to try to uh, do a, um, uh, a variational approach with machine learning. You said, okay, I'm going to assume a variation for this distribution, and I'm going to use neural networks for that. And what neural network did they use? Well, they use these energy-based Boltzmann machines. And that seems to be, when I talk to physicists in certain areas, this has become the state of the art in trying to uh, understand, solve this many-body quantum problem. Okay, so it's very, very interesting. And and when, whenever you have such probabilistic models in software, which is the current state of the art, there is an opportunity to put them put them on hardware and kind of accelerate them. So it's a very wide application space with, uh, and there are more AI applications. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm just trying to sort of set the stage where qubits kind of sit in between bits and qubits and they kind of overlap, they, they extend their arms to, to various applications in both of these, these arenas. And, and sometimes you can't do, for example, you can't do all of Q quantum computing and you can't do all of uh, deterministic computing either. So it's really a domain specific approach, which is kind of uh, uh, what everything else is uh, uh, these days, right? So, okay. So now let me show you what um, qubits are, okay? So if you're familiar, if you're coming from the field of you know uh, uh, machine learning, then Pbit is a binary stochastic neuron. Well, what is a binary stochastic neuron? Well, you have this object, let's consider this a hardware building block where you have an analog or continuous input and a digital output. And the way it works is, suppose that continuous input is zero, then you are getting this as a function of time or trial, usually time, you get these fluctuations between logic one and logic zero or logic plus one and logic minus one, okay? And if you take an average, you get this 50-50 fluctuations, okay? And with that analog tunability, you can change the, uh, the ratio of the plus ones you're getting to the ratio of minus ones you're getting, okay? So that's the, that's the sort of um, basic idea. And you can tune it in, in negatively or positively, and that changes the average probabilities that you get with this object. So it's quite simple if you look at the PBIT itself, right? And if you swept, you know, experimentalists like sometimes will sweep the input from you know negative to positive. In that case, you would see something like the blue curve like that. It, it would be pinned in, at some point. It would start fluctuating, and then it would be pinned again. Okay, so, and if you sat at one of those points and took an average, we design it in such a way that you get this um, sigmoidal activation that you might be very familiar from machine learning, okay? But I'd like to remind you that the PBIT will work with its binary output. It will never stop and take an average and then communicate it. It's basically always plus one or minus one. And I'll show you why that's such an important thing. Unlike neural networks where the output can be continuous. Now, there's a you know, strong hardware component in what I'll, I'll show you. And, and PBIT, just like you can make bits or qubits in many different ways, you can make PBITs in many different ways. And people have implemented, I'll be telling you more about this MTJ approach, a specific uh, spintronic device. It's kind of a very large scale device actually these days 
thanks to memory, magnetic tunnel junction. It's a magnetic device. But people have used the true random noise of diodes, for example. For example, a photonic diode, single photon avalanche diode, or digital CMOS, as I've been, we've been in my group uh, implementing PBIS. Or you can even be clever and do mixed signal CMOS implementations. So the field is still kind of looking for the best PBIT and best sort of um, energy efficient and, and um, uh, uh, kind of compact approach to, to build these things and scalable approach. Okay, but okay, that's good. That's for the PBIT, but how do you make a P computer? How do you build, how do you solve the problem with this? The PBIT is not enough, right? And the P computer, this is an architecture. This is a picture of a P computer architecture. And the way it works is you have these P bits like one, two, three, four, five, and those are your neighbors. Let's say that the blue one is you, okay? So this blue one basically takes input, takes asynchronous input from its neighbors. And then it does a weighted summation that is very commonly done in, in this machine learning, right? And and it you know it, after this weighted summation, it takes an input and then it makes a decision with its own clock, with its own kind of time scales, okay? So, this is the you know this is the architecture and and um, and of course this pivot could be could be input to one of these other pivots so it's a really a recurrent architecture there's feedback right if you know if if you're talking to me I'm talking to you also it doesn't have to be but that's a that's a common form of 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 doing it and um, and this is this is some this is something like a dynamical system you see because. You are getting asynchronous input from your neighbors. You're giving some input back to them and you go round and round like this. And sometimes we write this in equations. We say that, okay, that P bit picture that I showed you, that's described by this first equation. It's really simple. Take You take a random number and then you compare it with a, you know input, a continuous input, and then you take a sign. You do the signum function where you make it plus one or minus one. And then there's some sort of feedback between your neighbors and yourself. You have a weighted sum of uh, uh, inputs from your neighbors. And, and this goes kind of round and round and round. And that's this dynamical system. That's this coupled pivot idea. Now, what, where does this go to, this system? Now, there's very good theory behind this. There is a ground truth, okay? There is a ground truth where... Um, um, the, it, we, you have an energy function that the one that I described in the context of that combinatorial optimization problem. And this energy function is a lot of states. For a system of n p bits, it has two to the n states, and you're trying to extract the good states out of this uh, two to the n states. The good states are the ones that are emphasized by this energy function, the lowest and the lowest in energy, highest in probability. This uh, Boltzmann law says that, you know, if you have a low energy, you're going to have high probability. Just like in nature, we often hear this, right? If you have kind of low energy states have higher probability from, from this Boltzmann sense. So ground truth is very difficult to obtain. Okay, it's got two to the end states. In principle, you could do it, but it becomes very, very difficult. So PBITs try to approximate that um, ground truth. Okay, so that's the, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what this means in, in a second. Now, you could look at this energy function. You know, sometimes, you know, sharp students kind of pull me aside and they say, you know, why are you doing MI? Like, why is this energy look like, why does this look like this? It's J I J M I M J H I M I. If you see this as a polynomial, why did you stop at M I M J? And then I tell them, yes, that's a very good point. You don't have to stop at MIMJ, and you can do MIMJ MK and further, right? So, so this is a this coupling between the p bits doesn't have to be a linear coupling, because you know previously if you look at this, this is a linear summation, right? This JIJ MJ plus HI, I mean you basically have you can write this as a matrix vector product, right? But it could be much more complicated, and. Um, and these are things that are being discussed. This is a very active area right now where a lot of people try to take their models beyond these so-called uh, Ising models. So this, I didn't mention this, but this quadratic energy is typically is, 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 is known as the Ising or the Ising model. Okay, so um, because it was originally used to describe ferromagnetism and so on and so forth. But now it's a computational tool 
And people now try to think that, okay, I could have more complicated interactions, but then your um, your coupling, now you're kind of looking at MJ and M, like let's say you're looking at M1 and M2 as a combination before you decide what to do. Okay, so now one thing that's very important in PBIT literature is I'd like to get across is this MJs and MKs are zero or one. What that means is, I mean, you look at this this summation, right? You said, okay, how? I mean, this this term, and you say, who's gonna do that? That looks very complicated. Look at this double multiplication and so on. Well, there is really no multiplication. You see, it's either zero or one. So for a particular weight, J I J K, you are either getting a zero or a one. So you're either getting the weight or not. So that's why it's really not multiplication. And this binary nature of PBIT eases multiplication for hardware and implementation and scalability is a very important concept, okay? But that's it. That's the PBIT, it's architecture, it's coupling. And, um, and that's what we try to do. Now, these are all abstractions at this point. Uh, in, the, you know, in, a, in a few slides, I'll show you some real implementations of how we did this. But let me make one more point before I go there. And that is this idea of um, um, main motivation. Right? Why are we doing this? Now, as I mentioned to you, if you have a two PBIT system, then you're going to have four states, okay? Like up, 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 down, down, up, down, down, okay? Two PBITs and four states. Well, if you have four PBITs, you have 16 states. You know this law, this, ex this goes exponentially, right? This is two to the four now. And if you have six or eight states, you know, slowly it looks like the New York skyline, right? I mean, it's it's um, and it's at some point you don't want to draw this histogram because it's getting very, very difficult to do this, right? So in general, there are two to the N states of a coupled PBIT system. So it really lives, this network really lives in a two to the N by one probability distribution. So it's a vast sort of uh, uh, space to consider, to, to sort of uh, uh, sift through. Now, um, as I said, like these probabilities, these high, the skyline or the skyscraper probabilities that you're seeing, those are low energy states. Hence, they are, they are emphasized and their, their probability is, um, is emphasized, okay? And, um, uh, and this idea of the use, using a probabilistic computer to find or extract those states actually was originally proposed by Richard Feynman. You know, Richard Feynman, you may have heard of him as the founder or one of the founders, like with David Deutsch of quantum computing, um, because he made this point about if you're trying to simulate a quantum mechanical nature, use quantum mechanical building blocks, which is great, which is matching form to function, right? You're trying to solve something quantum, like you're trying to simulate coffee mixing with cream, just go and mix coffee with cream and it'll do what you're trying to compute. Same idea with quantum and same idea with probability. In fact, Feynman himself said this, the other way to simulate a probabilistic nature is by a computer, which itself is probabilistic. Okay, so we took a lot of inspiration from that. So the main motivation then is to have a probabilistic system to solve a probabilistic problem. If you get one thing out of this talk, that, that should be it. This idea that if you have a naturally probabilistic algorithm, it might make sense to build probabilistic hardware for this. Okay. So um, now here's a technical point. There's a lot of, you know, in physics, there's a lot of techniques to deal with this two to the N. In fact, I, I, I'm willing to go as far as to say that most of most physics is trying to take something that is exponential and trying to make it kind of computable and polynomial. And there is ideas like mean field theories, loopy belief propagations, uh, things like things that are trying to wade through this complexity. But in our experience, building these Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that the PBIT does, those two equations I showed you, it really beats all these other techniques that try to tame or contain this two to the n complexity. This is a technical point, but I could I could explain that later if you if you're if you're interested. Now here's a picture. Okay, this is kind of this is too abstract. Here's a picture of what we are trying to do. This is the main message. The main message is let physics do the computing. Now, if you look on the left, if you've taken a class on statistical mechanics and so forth, which they often talk about these interacting particles, interacting bodies, let's say in a box, could be gas molecules or, or whatever. And um, 
And if you think about how nature deals with these things, you can get a few clues as to the architecture or as to how nature computes. Well, in nature, for example, if you're a molecule or if you're a body on the top left corner, you have some friends, right? You have some local connections and local neighbors. First of all, nature is local. It doesn't, if you're a molecule on the left, you are connected to the rest of the box, but you don't have immediate connections to everybody, okay? So you're basically local in your connections. You'll only be affected by your immediate surroundings, right? And secondly, nature doesn't wait for anyone, right? I mean, it's asynchronous. Everything happens at the same time. Now, this is very natural in physics, but for us in computer engineering, computer architecture, and, and, and you know, computer science, you know, it's, it's, it's everything is clocked, right? Everything comes, you know, uh, very well synchronized, but nature isn't like that. But because everything is asynchronous, the system is massively parallel, meaning, you know, your computation will double if you double the size of this box. Now, that's exactly how we try to build these probabilistic computers. We are local. We have local connections to our surroundings. P-bits are locally connected. P-bits are asynchronous. Everybody can do what they want. And this means that they become massively parallel. And I'll try to make it more concrete later. I'll tell you that our performance increases. Computation increases with more p-bits. Okay, that's that's important. Okay, so let, now, let me now show you. So that's kind of the basic abstract pictures. Now let me show you some real systems. So state-of-the-art P computers, where things are. So a few years ago, we built this probabilistic computer. Now this is exactly the same architecture, okay? This thing is you've got p-bits here at the top, the, the PCB is the p-bits. And then you, you couple them, you couple them through a microcontroller, which is the, which contains the weights. So it's still that recurrent architecture, those two equations I showed you before, okay? So it's like, um, it's like you get these p-bits, they give their, they, they're connected to their neighbors. So they give, they get inputs from their neighbors and this goes round and round. So a few years ago, we solved this optimization problem. We said that, okay, let's solve a small scale factorization problem because that, that can be written as an factor as an optimization problem. It's a, it's a prototypical optimization problem. People in the quantum community, uh, they've, they've done this before, writing factoring is an optimization problem. And um, we saw that, okay, we could, you know, our system naturally goes to low energy states of this uh, of this thing. Okay, so that, that's what we showed. But I often joke uh, uh, to, uh, to my colleagues and friends that, um, you know, it took us three or four years just to get this sort of nano device experiment. Because here, what I didn't tell you is we are using the MTJ that I told you uh, before, the stochastic nano devices that have inherent noise in them, right? But we could only do an eight-bit computer. I mean, great, but wonderful experiment. It was important. It was, you know, published, etc. cetera. But um, uh, it was very small. So in the last few years, as, as, you know, after I came to UCSB, I wanted to scale this up. Does this algorithm, does this idea of p-bits and asynchronous architecture, et cetera, does it really bring about any benefits compared to other things? And then we started to implement them on FPGAs, you know, field programmable gate arrays. You're probably all familiar, but if you're not, these are programmable computer chips that you can design uh, from scratch. You can, you can come up with a new architecture and just kind of build it in the FPGA. And we were able to go to 5,000 p-bits. And with 5,000 p-bits, we saw that we can factor numbers that are much bigger, and I'll show you even bigger results. Um, and we already saw that compared to the competition with other FPGAs or our own result or ASIC designs or D-Wave, we were doing a lot better. And you can see this an exponential scale from 8-bit to 32-bit. The numbers get to uh, places where you don't want to read them out loud anymore, you know, so so if you're not a native speaker, right? So so this is this is basically what we did. So we saw that, okay, this architecture seems very, very um, uh, interesting and promising. And um, we've also been doing combining the two. So this, this, is a, this is a heterogeneous ideas and architectures where, you know, take the, whoops, sorry. So take the random number from uh, the MTJ and give it to an FPGA. So my group has been working on uh, trying to sort of build heterogeneous systems where you can maybe release some of the resources in the FPGA and give them, give the randomness from outside, which is what I believe 
I mean, if you're following this field of, you know, hardware, I think the future will involve more and more heterogeneous things. Like, unlike doing everything with MTJs, you will have to connect to the CMOS under layer. You will have to do things, you know, play nice with the existing ecosystem and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, let me make one final point on this slide. You see this 5,000 looks impressive, but it's actually, imagine how many transistors we had to use for that. A lot, you know, thousands, millions, you know, this was perhaps billions because, because P-bits are, when you do them in CMOS, they're very expensive. So, so nano device isn't completely irrelevant. If you want to go to a million bit computer, P-bit computer, then you will have to do something new. CMOS is just too expensive to emulate randomness and correlations and correlated P circuits. You know, I often talk about maybe just like quantum supremacy, this is something we've been talking about for a while, can we define probabilistic advantage and supremacy? And the idea is, can we do something more than just the FPGA? Can we really kind of have an energy-based model or something and you know have this big network, put it on the FPGA plus MTJ and beat the old digital FPGA? That would be something like a notion of a probabilistic advantage or supremacy. And, and there's of course crucial need from expertise from all across the stack. You need to do algorithms well, you need to do hardware well, you need to understand the hardware to change the algorithm, you need to understand the algorithm to change the hardware, right? This is this notion of uh, co-design that's very, very important. We've also explored crazy ideas. I mean, we are desperate by trying to kind of make them bigger. And this is something we've been working on. Why don't we have multiple FPGAs have a big graph, split it into multiple graphs and put each graph into one of these FPGAs, minimize communication, so-called the min cut problem. Okay, so this is really funny. Everybody talks about the max cut problem where they try to maximize the connections between partitions. I always found that artificial, but the min cut problem, all of you will appreciate. If I give you a big graph, and I tell you, why don't you split it into two so that I can put one half to one FPGA and one half to another FPGA. You would say that, oh, it's a good idea to minimize the connections between, it, it's a good idea to split this graph in such a way so as to minimize the connection between those partitions, right? Because then your communication bottleneck will, be, will, not, will not be a bottleneck or at least it'll be better. So that's the so-called mean cut problem. And we have to solve that to kind of put these into multiple FPGAs. And our vision is, you know, we're, we're trying to get there, 100K to 250K P-bit computers by 2024. And of course, you the, the, the real vision is to go to a million bit or more, um, and maybe 10 million or 100 million. And we can do that with these MTJs because unlike many other nano devices that you've been hearing, MTJ is a real technology. In fact, it's been already put down in CMOS chips, standalone chips with billion, with a B components. So this already exists. But of course, we can't use MTJs because MTJs are typically used for memory. So, so we, need, um, um, uh, uh, we need basically um, uh, 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 bad memory, right? You need fluctuations. So it's not that easy, but there is a path towards such large scale computers in the future. Okay, so now uh, the next part is a little bit device physics-y. So I'm going to uh, uh, be quick on those parts so that you know, in the interest of time, if you're interested, I can come back to that. This is, um, uh, uh, we built, so this was the behavioral thing that I, I told you about. And, and, and you, know, uh, you need these two state systems, bistable systems with randomness. And we get that randomness from the physics of magnetism, okay? And in physics of magnetism, for example, your fridge magnet, it's got these two states, red state and blue state, and they're separated by a, four, by a large energy barrier, 40 times the thermal energy. So for the magnet to sort of go from one state to the other, it needs to throw this very low probability dice, okay? It needs to, because it's an, because it's energy, the, the probability of switching over is, is exponential on the energy barrier, okay? So um, usually 
what they that means is if you put the energy barrier to 40 to 60 times the thermal energy your magnet will stay there for a number of years that's why you never see your fridge magnet just dropping from the fridge it's it's kind it's kind of it's locked there for 10 20 years or 100 years or whatever okay but if you reduce that energy barrier from 40 kT to about a kT or so, then you see this very strange phenomenon, okay? Which is you can see this magnetization fluctuating as a function of time. And, um, and there is this device that's called a magnetic tunnel junction where you can have a magnet and a fixed magnet. And if one of those magnets are fluctuating, the resistance of that device is changing. This is called a magnetic tunnel junction and that's how people build memory. Now, what people have noticed in the memory industry for a long time is that if their energy barrier, if they mess up the energy barrier, for example, you are doing designing magnets and you messed up this energy barrier, it's about KT instead of 40 KT. What they've seen is this resistance as a function of time fluctuates. Now, this is the world's worst memory device. You know, you put your uh, graduation pictures the bits start flipping right away. You lose the image right away, right? But it's very good stochastic device because you're kind of doing this free random number generation. And we 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 started this, you know, there's it's remarkable. And if you're in this field, I don't want to go on too much on this thing, but um in the in the beginning, what we saw was very little is has been written on low energy barrier magnets. In fact, you see the classic papers in magnetism, and they will say, oh. Uh, we can do the low energy limit, low barrier limit, but it's clearly uninteresting. Who needs a magnet that is non-volatile? Okay, so, so non-volatility has been very fundamental to magnetism. Okay, so in fact, we were fortunate to do the first serious theory of some of these things, and we saw that these fluctuations can be very fast, picoseconds to nanoseconds. And in, at, in those days, sometimes people were skeptical. Nobody has seen such fluctuations, but recently many, many experiments, okay? Showing these MTJs can be sh showing these nanosecond fluctuations, okay? So, so this is a rare case that I say where, where theory somewhat uh, preceded the experiment. Usually theoreticians like to sort of explain everything once the facts are clear, okay? So in this case, in this case, we had this very uh, uh, unusual event where theory preceded the experiment, okay? So th this is, as you can see from the dates and the players, there's a very active field in device community. They're trying to make uh, fast MTJs and so on and so forth. And let me, uh, in the interest of time, sort of show you uh, quickly how you build a PBIT out of these MTJs. Because remember, all I've shown you is resistance fluctuations, okay? Because the MTJ's resistance changes as a function of this uh, parallel or anti-parallel configuration. You fix one layer, the other fluctuates, your resistance changes. Okay, but how do you make a PBIT? You are talking about an electrical device. So the way you make a PBIT is you take the MTJ, you use the STT MRAM uh, cell, okay? So this is how they, they do it in that STT MRAM community. There's a one, there's one MTJ and a transistor, and, and that's how they build their memory cells. Now, what we're saying is you can build that cell, but you can add one more inverter, one more inverter. And if you replace this good magnet with a bad magnet, okay, so stay, so basically an unstable magnet, then um you're you're going to you're going to see these tunable fluctuations that uh uh, that look like the PBIT, okay? So that's that's basically what you wanted. You have now an electrical input, the input of the transistor's gate, and then the output is basically nearly binary, not always, but it shows these fluctuations as kind of like a, a, a kind of like an approximate PBIT, okay? And and the way you can make this more like this one by playing with magnet parameters, etc. There's a lot of design details, variations, etc. It becomes a real technology problem at that point. Okay, so we have some recent developments uh, on this. Uh, we can now see one micro. I'm just going to be very quick. I told you that one nanosecond MTJs have been demonstrated as a single device. We've made p bits like this using circuits like this. We've made p bits that are now fluctuating with microseconds, with microseconds. So this is kind of um, getting you know getting exciting it's becoming very fast etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. okay now um 
let me in my in the last you know uh, uh, ten minutes or or you know five six minutes, let me show you a few examples of actual problems, like concrete examples on hard optimization. Okay. Now the problem I'm going to choose is this um, integer factorization problem. Okay. So integer factorization is a problem that is of fundamental interest in cryptography and so on. Let me make one thing clear. For us, it will be a hard benchmark problem, as you are very familiar in computer architecture and so on. So here's going to be a benchmark problem. Now, in computer science, there is this problem of circuit satisfiability, circuit sat, you know, fundamental problem, NP complete. And the idea is if I give you a Boolean circuit, and if I give you the answer, let's say this is a multiplier for those of you who didn't recognize it's a multiplier where you have end gates and full adders. This is really nothing but schoolbook multiplication. You multiply your bits, you add them, you multiply, you shift, you add, you shift, you add. This is schoolbook multiplication circuit, okay? Now, this circuit can multiply. Now, circuit satisfiability asks the following question. It says, okay, you can do a multiplication. I get it. What if I gave you the output? Can you tell me the factors? For example, if I told you that the product is 21, can you find the satisfying input, which is seven and three or three and seven? Can you find those answers if I give you the product? That is the circuit satisfiability problem. Now, if we build these end gates and full adders out of p bits, then they can they become the they, they can become so-called invertible. In hardware, you can ask this question to the circuit. You can say, you can fix the output to 21 and you can ask the circuit, okay, go and find the satisfying input. So that really becomes possible in hardware, the circuit set problem. And the way this becomes a, um, a p-bit network is first of all, you write all these full adders and end, end gates, you replace them with their probabilistic versions. So it becomes a p-end and a p-full adder and whatnot. And then it becomes this complicated network that looks like the eye of Sauron or whatever, right? So this looks like, it. so this is 3,400 PV. It's a complicated network. It's described by an energy. And there, there's an enormous amount of states that this network can go to. Basically two raised to the power of that number. You know, so it's, it's a huge uh, space. But we solve this by clever algorithms called, you know, like, like simulated annealing and more sophisticated algorithms like parallel tempering, which I can talk uh, about. And after a while, you go and you find it's a heat map of all the replicas. That they're fluctuating. Some of them are getting colder. Some of them are actually cold. And in the end, after some 123 trillion flips, random numbers and flips, you find the ground state. OK, so uh, and we compare this. And uh, earlier I showed you 32 bit p-bit co computer in 2022. Now with clever algorithms, we can go to 40 bits. So it's a very difficult problem. It's exponential, but with clever algorithms, we're making more and more progress, okay? And, and you can do other things to solve some larger problems. You can solve the so-called um, uh, uh, GNF. You can like apply this approach to field sieve algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But here it's just to show you that this approach is promising and then you can do, you can do larger and larger problems, especially if you do this hardware algorithm called design, put them on FPGAs or MTJs, find good algorithms and try to solve uh, large problems. Now, I'd like to, um, I'd like to take your, you know, direct your attention to this thing though. We required 123 trillion integer, basically this is an integer, that many random numbers. And it took like three minutes or so to do that. So that's a very large throughput. You need a lot of, lot of, lot of random numbers. And in my, you know, in my, you know, in a few minutes, I will show you um, uh, how that is so important to increase the flips per second. Meaning if you take a trillion samples every second, then it's going to be 123 seconds rather than 200, right? I mean, uh, I'm sorry, that's just going to be one set. Yeah, that's going to be 120 to 20 seconds. It's going to be two minutes if you can you know, increase your uh, uh, flips per second. So that's very, very important, as I'll show you. Now, this is an optimization, but uh, recently we've been trying to train neural networks, you know, deep neural networks with, with such p-bits. And, you know, you can apply some of these um, energy-based models to solve generative machine learning problems. And you design these... Um, 
um, hybrid computers, okay? So this is, you have a probabilistic computer that can take probabilistic samples very well. So your classical computer computes gradients. So you have this hybrid setup where your probabilistic computer does something very difficult, which is generating samples from the from a difficult distribution. And then your classical computer does easy derivatives and it gives you a new weight to your probabilistic computer. And then in this feedback loop, you train something big. And, and recently, you know, uh, I, I don't wanna, I just wanna show you a flavor of these things. I don't wanna uh, get into too much detail, but we've um, trained things like sparse networks that D-wave, the quantum annealers use. These are certain graphs. This is called the Pegasus graph because it looks like a bird if you look from the diagonal. And then this is the Zephyr graph, some other sparse graph that these quantum computers use. So we use these networks to train the full MNIST model. Now to experts like uh, Professor Bo, for example, he will look at this and he will say the MNIST model, like we we haven't been doing the MNIST model since the Clinton administration, right? So so it is it is very old, I get it. But from people who start from the hardware, like we start from basically from scratch, nobody does full MNIST. It's very difficult to, to get to that level because we are literally designing the computer from the ground up. Okay, and in D-Wave, etc., nobody trains the full MNIST. But we did that with you know sparse deep Boltzmann machines. We saw that you know with a few thousand parameters, we could match the uh, uh, full, uh, fully dense, densely connected restricted Boltzmann machine accuracies and things like that. And we could even do image generation. Okay, so I mean they don't. Uh, they're not the state of the art. This isn't like the uh, as good as the diffusion models. But it shows the idea that that this field with Ising machines of the type that is physical computers, you can revive some of these old things and there could be a lot of interesting things uh, uh, with that, okay? So um, I have uh, one final example before I show you a few benchmarks and then conclude. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, uh, learning quantum systems with qubits is, is, is a feasible and possible approach, okay? So you have something like a quantum Hamiltonian now, this is complicated notation. If you are um, from that uh, field, it's, of course, very clear. This is the Heisen, the so-called Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Now, if you're not from that field, that's fine. But, the, the, but what I'd like to tell you is this is a formidable object. Now, previously, I was writing energies, and I mentioned that I have two to the n states. It's very difficult, blah, blah, blah. But now, the quantum system, it not only has two to the n, it's now become a two to the n by two to the n matrix. So you can't even write this down, let alone find its lowest energy eigenvalue, which would correspond to the ground state. That's like, it's hopeless. So as I said, people have, people have tried to map neural networks to solve this problem, this so-called variational approach. You guess the form of the ground state and you try to train a neural network uh, using reinforcement type learning algorithms. And, you know, uh, and, and, and we've done that, okay? Because they, they used these Boltzmann machines, which I showed you in the previous slide. And, and you can map them to uh, sparse networks that, that the PBITs can use. And here's a, you know, uh, unpublished simple example where we find the ground state of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian as a function of number of iterations. So there are of course details here that I'm not showing, but then that shows the idea of how qubits can help solve the quantum many-body problem. And if you do this in hardware, that can be much faster than what you would have got from software simulations. Okay, so that's the, that's the main point. I have two more ideas and then we're we are kind of, uh, uh, we, you know, we, we can conclude. So the qubit connect comparisons are fine, but with all due respect, qubit comparisons are also not very good because qubits are you know very small. They can't solve any important problem. So the real comparison is bits. Can you beat our existing powerful digital computers like GPUs? You know, qubits are intellectually interesting, but we should not bully qubits too much because you know they're st still trying to get their uh, basic computers together and so on. So we'll see. That remains to be seen. But uh, we, we have to compare qubits with bits. And there I'll show you two comparisons, which is um, the device level comparison, and then I'll show you a system level comparison. Okay. So the device level comparison is something like this. I showed you this 
MTJ based P bit that was giving us these tunable random numbers. Now, when I show this to students, for, for example, experts in digital design and so on, they look at this and say, I could do that in an FPGA, right? And in fact, we ourselves do this on FPGAs all the time. Okay, how would you do this on an FPGA or on a digital ASIC? Well, you need a pseudo random number generator because your pivot seems to have some randomness. Well, you need a hyperbolic tangent lookup table, which this circuit gives you for free, but okay, I can do that in an FPGA. And then I need a comparator. So that's good. So the tunability is coming from the lookup table. The randomness comes from a pseudo random number generator. These are two common pseudo random number generators. One of them is LFSR, linear feedback shift register. And the other is not a, a, a the sort of a Japanese kind of term. It's XOR shift rotate. Okay, so Shiro is XOR shift rotate. So that's another uh, type of um, a pseudo random number generator. Okay, so if you do this with FPGAs and with PBIT, let's look at some numbers. Okay, let's look at the transistor counts. Now, suppose you're doing a 32 bit random number generator, which has a good, decent period. Now, it turns out if you use the simplest random number generator, which is the LFSR, linear feedback shift register, just for the randomness, you need about a thousand transistors, 1100 transistors, just for the random number. If you'd like to add the tunability, which we need, then you, you require, now, now suddenly it becomes 5,000 transistors. Now, if you're training neural networks and stuff, you quickly realize, hold on a minute, this LFSR is a cheap random number, but its quality is just not good enough. You fail. You can't train neural networks with LFSRs. You need something more. And then you learn about, oh, somebody has discovered this more sophisticated random number generator. Let me use that. Well, suddenly you need 7,500 transistors just for the tuner, just for the random number generator. And then you need 11,000 transistors for the, for the uh, full PBIT. Whereas this SMTJ-based PBIT is like a few transistors and an MTJ. So you can see this enormous difference between the digital design and this mixed signal or analog design. And, and you can do the math, just 1 million p-bits requires 10 billion transistors. And that does not include the synapse, the readout, the IO. So it's kind of, you can't put this on a chip. You're never going to have 10 billion or 10 million p-bit computer if you stick to digital uh, computers. Okay, so that's the point. And, you know... Uh, there's, of course, an associated energy cost. You can calculate the energy per RNG, and you can see that you, you also require 100x less energy with, with p-bits. And, and, and uh, that, that's why we like, you know, even though in my group and others are doing these digital designs, there is a need, there's a big need for uh, these nano device implementations. Now, here's my uh, final slide, final point, which is um, this... Um, system level comparison, okay? So, okay, we discussed this one p-bit comparison, but we need a system level comparison. Now, over the years, we've, we've been trying to come up with metrics to measure the p-bit performance. And one metric that stands out, which I briefly mentioned in the beginning and later in the factorization example, is the idea of flips per second, okay? And flips per second is something like this. If you require a trillion samples to solve a problem, it's obvious that if you take more samples per second, you're gonna get to one trillion samples more quickly. So that's why increasing this flips per second seems to be a good idea, okay? So here's a picture that, that, that is basically published data where we compare with the state of the art in bits, GPUs, TPUs. So these are, and these are results from the, the, one, the ones that on the top left, the bunched up results there, are results from NVIDIA and Google where they solve the same sampling problem, the same Ising problem. Actually, they solve a simple, slightly simpler version of the problem. But for this discussion, let's ignore that. Now, you can see that sampling throughput on the x-axis, that's flips per second. You can see something like 10 flips per nanosecond. 10 flips per nanosecond. That's that's quite impressive. Your clock cycles are your clocks are around gigahertz or so. So um, it means that you're taking 10 flips per clock cycle. Remember, flip is a complicated thing. It's not a flop. 
You need a random number generator. You need to do the summation. You need to do the uh, uh, sign activation. It's a lot of clock cycles. It's a lot of flops to get one. Uh, so these are already very parallelized and impressive. 10 flips per nanosecond, right? But with FPGAs already today, the stuff that I've showed you, we are around you know 100 to 200 flips per nanosecond. That's 200 billion flips per second. So in five seconds, you're taking it trillion samples today and our projections are if you have these mtj based p computers if you, if that they can be built that can be a million flips per nanosecond okay there's there's a lot of work for us to sort of put more data points between those p1 and p2 and we think that um, nano devices can help greatly it can take our performance to to the stratosphere basically okay so um uh, with that uh, i'd like to conclude and uh, I told you a little bit about, I tried to give you a flavor of this idea of um, P computing, probabilistic computing. It connects to machine learning and quantum computing. They can be implemented in various ways, diodes, MRAM, CMOS, FPGA, and, and other things. And I talked about this notion of probabilistic supremacy or advantage. Can you do something that you can't do otherwise? That's what, that's what, supremacy or advantage means, right? Like solve a problem that is previously unsolvable, right? And um, which problems to accelerate? How do you wrap this to problems? Well, the main point of the talk, if you have a probabilistic problem, then P-bits could be a good fit and machine learning and AI optimization. These are full of examples. These are full of problems where you need probabilistic architectures and 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 problems algorithms so um with that i'd like to conclude and um uh leave the floor uh, back to bo uh, thank you thank you karen so this is a very very inspiring talk i i, I learned a lot of that and i actually i have many questions but first sure, yeah so I leave the questions for our audience. So if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself or input in the chat box. So any questions from the audience? I think there's a question in the chat box. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Um, uh, so I have the question is I'm I'm uh, let me read it. I have a question about Ising computing such as factorization. How could I be certain that we can obtain the answer, the or the ground state? It appears that this is a heuristic algorithm rather than a deterministic one. You that's ac actually uh, uh, true. So this is you you've put your you know, finger on on a very important uh, point. Yes, this is a, uh, a heuristic model, and uh, these problems in Ising computing are usually uh, uh, in NP, meaning there is no known uh, way of deterministically or probabilistically or whatever whatever algorithm you use. There is no known way of solving them in polynomial time. You can only verify them in polynomial time, right? So what do we do? Often students when they hear, or, or kind of non-experts when they hear this NP, they think that, oh, you know, this is an NP, we can never solve it. That's not true. You know, in, in real life, we solve NP problems all the time. And the key thing is you very often don't need the ground state. Now, factorization is an important exception to this rule. I just, I was, I was saying, so it's kind of in factorization, you need the ground state to break cryptography or whatever. But in many other problems, let's say you are calling an Uber and Uber has to solve it, something like a traveling salesperson problem in the background. Now you're freezing in, in the cold in, in New York. You want to go back to, you go back to uh, Rutgers. Do you care if you pay 10 cents more for, for Uber? No, you don't. You want a good enough solution. So many of these cases, and, and the taxi doesn't care, nobody cares. In real world, humans often don't care about being absolutely correct. Uh, if it's good enough, it's good enough. So that's why these heuristic algorithms in many cases are enough, but you're absolutely correct that we cannot guarantee, nor do we get the ground state at all times. So thank you for that question.
That's a, that's a, another question. So, um, right. Uh, so uh, Larry, Larry O'Gorman asks, um, you might have mentioned this, but weather forecasting seems probabilistic and requiring huge resources. Have you thought about applying peak computers to this? That's very interesting. Um, weather forecasting indeed is probabilist naturally probabilistic. It is often solved by something that looks like, uh, I presume, Monte Carlo algorithms. No, Larry, we haven't uh, thought about this, uh, but I think it is a good example of that at least deserves evaluation, uh, whether you know we can accelerate some of that computation, which is naturally probabilistic. Actually, um, that, that's that's uh, something that's escaped my attention. I've never thought about this. That's something we should uh, think about. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Thank you. A, I'd love to see these make a huge leap over um, our current forecasting. That would be <laughs> that would certainly uh, put these things on the map. That, that's very interesting, Larry. Thank you for that point. You know, I've uh, we've looked at, or at least uh, there is a lot of things in our our our, our list, etc. This um, I had never thought about, but it's it certainly deserves evaluation and and thinking. Thank you for that point. Um, Thank you. Th thanks, uh, Alan asks: Do MTJs require strict temperature control, uh, heating or cooling to control the flip rates? Uh, or keep the PBIT within expected spec. Another uh, excellent question because I I showed this MTJ plot. Maybe I go back uh, just very very briefly uh, to this picture. So this is the this is the unstable MTJ, right? And and it is correct as Alan points out that there's temperature dependence here. Now the key thing though the temp you know this this fluctuation rate is exponential delta over kT, right? So when delta is small, what happens to an exponential when you make the exponent small? The exponential dependence goes away, right? e to the minus x becomes 1 minus x. So, Alan, what happens is if you make the barrier low enough, the exponential dependence goes away. So basically, even though there's temperature fluctuations, you don't see orders of magnitude change in flip rates because exponential delta over kT is so small that it's not exponential anymore, really. So typically, we don't do any heating or cooling. But I, I don't want to say that there is, you know, all the problems with MTJ variations and so forth are, are under control. One good thing is with PBITs, you don't care for them to be exactly having the same um, uh, uh, fluctuation rate because it's asynchronous and random anyway. So it's not like everybody has to fall in line. So those are all the good things that come from the algorithm. So we don't require any heating or cooling because of the because the barrier, if you can engineer the barrier to be low. For large enough barriers, would this would be a significant concern. So we want them to be fast and low barrier. Yeah, very good, very good point. Um YQ asks, um, looks like correlated PBITs are not supposed to update parallelly. But the uncorrelated PBITs can update simultane simultaneously. Uh, may I know the reason? So this is um, uh, uh, this is excellent. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, OIQ is uh, uh, familiar with with this with this uh, idea. So um, yes, this is correlated PBITs. You're you're not supposed to update them in parallel. This is very well known. If you do this in software, one of the mistakes all of us make when we start is. You see, I mean, may, maybe um, uh, this is such an important point that maybe if you if you allow me, I will just um, uh, show you these equations again. Now, if you uh, maybe not this one, but this one. So um, so uh, if you look at these equations, if you ask, look at these equations. Now you look at this and you say, oh, I want to update all M I in parallel because that looks like a vector of M, and what is more natural than doing a vectorized update, right? But if you do that, the PBITs don't go to the desired ground state. And that's very sad because it means that this algorithm is fundamentally serial. What that means is if you have two PBITs that are connected, you can't update them in parallel because then they can get, get they can start oscillating. For example, if they are trying to disagree, they, they will, and they, they're in the beginning, let's say the same. And they will ch they both change their state. Let's say they are one one. They both become minus one minus one, 
and then they both become plus one, plus one. They're trying to disagree, but because you're updating them in parallel, they can't disagree. It's a very kind of pathological thing. If they were a little bit out of lockstep, I mean, imagine trying to avoid someone in the grocery store and because, you know, and then locking, locking, getting into this oscillation between them. It's a little bit like that. So um, this is, this makes the, but, but the, so you can't do a, for, a kind of a parallelized update. You have to update the first one and then the second one based on the first one, right? And this is called GIP sampling, very well known in AI. You may have seen this idea before. But um, in hardware like you, what happens is you don't have to worry about this because if they're asynchronous, then they don't, the, the probability of a collision is very low because you don't, because they update in their own time. They, they fire when they fire. And the, 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 the probability of like getting into this infinite loop is basically zero. So that's why doing this asynchronous architecture also gains us something. That's something that was previously serial now can effectively be in parallel. So it's a deep and subtle point that I didn't uh, talk about at all. Uh, so, so thank you for that question. Hopefully that made some sense. Other questions from the audience? So if no more questions, actually, I have several questions to ask. Please, yeah. Yeah, please yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, why, why, for these wonderful questions. Actually, it's very, uh, yeah, it's they're all very good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So first, I have one question about one of your slides. You show your IPGA implementation compared with the, the uh, prior work. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and for, uh, the fact, for the factor uh, integrals, yeah. I see, I see, I see. So let me... Let me go there quickly, Bo, and um, uh, just a second. Yeah, maybe maybe this one. Uh, uh, or maybe yeah. yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. Okay. So so yeah. So because here you mentioned that uh, we can use the RBM, FPGA RBM to do the integral factorization. So it's actually, actually that's very interesting because I remember my my last work during my PhD is that the. Uh, VSI design for the RBM, and uh, at that time I, oh. I I didn't know that, so we can use that for the for the for the integral <laughs> factorization. So the experiment about the MNIST uh, uh, classification. So I was wondering. So here you we use the P computer to do that. So it is also like it's based on the icing model to do that. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So because we know RBM is also kind of using the icing model. Very yes. Simple. Yes. Right. Yes, very much so. In fact, the difference between RBM, Bo, and what we did is basically I come from hardware and I know I'm bullish on this idea of sparsity, in sp and spatial sparsity, meaning, you know, RBM came from computer scientists who never wanted to put this on hardware or anything. And RBM, for those of you who don't know, is a bipartite fully connected graph. So if you have 100 yeah. one layer neurons in one layer, it's connected to all the other 100 neurons in the other layer. Now that's that results in very dense connections. Now, um, what we did with this FPGA-based P computer is a graph that is not bipartite, but it is sparse. I mean, it does. you can't tell from this picture on the left but it is really, really sparse, our computer. So it only I only have, let's say, five or six connections, but I can have more P bits and I can have more layers. I can be deeper, for example, not just visible, hidden. I can be visible, hidden, 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 but I'm sparse. Oh. So that fits very well to FPGA. So you can put, because otherwise, and you can make these asynchronous parallel updates, you, a lot of good things that co comes with sparsity, spatial sparsity. So that is the difference that allowed us to go to bigger scales and and solve larger problems. But you're absolutely right. From a you know theoretical point of view, we also did a Boltzmann machine. It just wasn't restricted. It it allowed all connections, unlike RBM where intralayer connections are forbidden. Yeah. And yeah. then we also weren't fully dense. So we changed the architecture. It's more Physics inspired, if you if you allow okay. me to say that it's more nature inspired. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. And and another question is about the the source to to generate the randomness. So here you use like the MTJ to do that, right? And so it, actually it reminds me that like um, 
like in the hardware security, so we know that we can use the different type of the, the uh, emerging devices to generate randomness for to to develop path, right? And uh, so I know that so we can like we can use the MTJ, we can use the MAM resistors, but also we can like just use the, the like the the SRAM or the D like the SRAM, right? To to generate randomness to for to serve the path. So then I was wondering whether we can also use like those uh, using the kind of the, the unstable in the digital CMOS to serve as the, the randomness source in your application. Absolutely. Uh, it's a very good point. And I'd like to, you know, I, I have been working on MTJs, but I, I'm going to be very frank that, um, so I would put, there are many ways to get this tunable randomness. And you know, I talked about MTJ. I have colleagues who did, uh, SPADs, I have diodes, I have colleagues who did membristers, like you mentioned. And um, however, if you're talking about scaling fast, I do agree that, for example, uh, by metastable SRAMs, right? You put you put the kind of cell into this middle state, and then you get this randomness because of their CMOS com compatibility. I would put them in the mixed signal CMOS category, which is like you're not completely digital. You're deriving some yeah. uh, th analog noise. Very interesting, Bo. And um, one thing, yeah. So, so one thing is getting fluctuations in time. That's very useful. So let me make that distinction. For example, in that metastable randomness example you gave, sometimes you go, you, you, you kind of it goes somewhere and then it gets stuck there. You put the ball to the top of the energy barrier. It either falls left or it falls right. You know, in these MTJs, one good thing is it fluctuates as a function of time. If such designs with, and that kind of helps you because you don't have to reset. It kind of computes all the time. Now, if th those types of things can be arranged with um, SRAMs or DRAMs, or in fact, um, you make it so fast that it doesn't matter. Maybe it's uh, it's it gets stuck, but uh, you can reset it very quickly, etc. Those are very, very good open uh, um, uh, aspects of this of this field. And now many people have proposed many, many other pivots. So, so um, energy efficiency, scalability, all all that being considered, I think the the question is open whether one can have better pivots. So that's a very interesting thing that uh, I haven't uh, uh, explored myself. I'm not sure if. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, I know that random number generation exists in those fields, but to for these PBIT type applications, whether that has been looked at, um, I don't know. But it's very, it sounds very interesting to me, and I don't have a fundamental disagreement with it. Oh, that'll never work or anything. In fact, the fact that it's CMOS compatible makes it very important because maybe yeah, you can make yeah. it much bigger, right? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I have. Final question. <laughs> I promise this is the last one. Yeah. No, no, so, it's okay. It's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know that. So this is a probabilistic computing. And uh, so yes. and actually, so we have used the random number generator to generate, to do kind of the, the information coding. So, so in, in my understanding. And so actually, so I was wondering, is there any kind of the hidden connection with the, like the, the stochastic computing? So you mentioned, you mentioned that like Shav and also I did that before. And also, Hidden connection to the spike in your work. Okay, because that's you know that especially for the spike in your work, it's also kind of using the synchronized computing yes, pattern. Yes. So using the kind of rate coding format to right, do that. Right, right, right. So this is a. I guess it's a wonderful uh, final question because it's so kind of it, it's kind of open. So let me try to give a compact, uh, meaningful answer if I can. So um. With stochastic computing, there's of course similarities. Let me talk about the similarities. I mean, we work with stochastic bit streams. It's kind of uh, sounds very similar in that sense, but there are some differences. Which in stochastic computing, usually you um, you uh, try to, for example, one major application is to um, uh, simplify arithmetic operations. For example, you have a long bit stream. You tr you try to you get easy multiplication for analog quantities, for example, things like that. You know, in that sense, this is a little bit different. You never try to do it with PBITs. You never really require, you're never really going after uh, traditional applications like digital multiplication, I mean, or analog multiplication and so forth. But there are similarities. And and um, 
And I think that there's ideas could be useful, like stochastic computing could look here and try to do some of the applications we've been looking at. And we could look at stochastic computing, which is a very rich and established field. And we could get some of the good ideas they've developed uh, over the years. Right. So it's kind of similar, but with different focus, I, at least so far. But maybe that connections can be made stronger. Now, with spiky neural networks, I think it's similar that you're right that many, for example, in, in spikes, they often say that their binary uh, operation eases multiplication. You know, when I talk to like Professor Priya Panda or people from that field, they say that, oh, that's very similar. Multiplication yeah. easy for us, multiplication is easy for you. They are asynchronous, we are asynchronous. That's also very good. But one thing, Bo, is that I, I found kind of um, like, you know, that field is very important in like in special niche uh, uh, machine learning applications like optical event-based uh, uh, flows and cameras, etc. But for computing, I find the idea of a spike somewhat it may be unnecessary you may see you may say that okay it's for biological inspiration it's great but if all you need is a stochastic kind of binary output do i have to worry about the details of biological spikes and so on that i'm not sure but you're right that that field and, and our field is also kind of colliding recently i've seen intel people solving optimization problems I asked the same question to them that do you really need the spike if you're doing optimization problems and so on? But this is a friendly um, uh, thing. I think I view that field as a, a, a kind of a similar field like us with the same goals and and like algorithm hardware co-design. Similarly, we probably have a lot to learn uh, uh, from from each other. So uh, I hope that 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 is a reasonable answer uh, to, yeah, to yeah, your wonderful you. questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks. So, uh, any other questions from the audience? Oh, I think there's another question. Sure, yes. So I see Bolin asks, um, the energy barrier is difficult to control, which can lead to device variability. So um, Bolin, I talked about this a little bit. When um, the energy barrier is, is low, the variability problem gets better because of the idea that your energy, your time is exponential in the barrier, like this uh, exponential, uh, um, uh, let me uh, try to show you maybe instead of speaking in formulas. So for example, here, uh, this, you are right that for, let's say a 10 to 15 KT magnet, a little bit of variation on the exponential can lead to fluctuations from years to days, for example. Because, you know, you change the delta a little bit, 5 kT and exponential 20 and exponential 15 are so different, then you're going to have a lot of variation. But when energy barrier is low, that problem goes away because exponential of a low number, exponential of X when X is small, isn't really an exponential anymore. And um, the idea that it's difficult to get them to low barriers that's not really, uh, uh, I mean, that, that may not be so difficult. First of all, there's a lot of experiments. You can check these things from, you know, the three different groups. They can make very low barrier magnets. In fact, when you talk to magnet people, they say, oh, it's very difficult to make them stable. It's very difficult to make a 40 nanometer dot thermally stable. If you say that I want the barrier to be as low as possible, they come up with all sorts of tricks. And there's a lot of work uh, in this area. Now our collaborators from Tohoku, for Professor Shunsuke Fukami, for example, can get us very low barrier magnets on, you know, on demand at this point. So more experiments are needed, but not a fundamental problem. Let me end with that. So uh, another question, what is the connection between PBITS and restricted Boltzmann machine? So we, uh, we, we talked about this with Professor Bo a little bit. It is really similar, uh, but with PBITS, you don't have to restrict anything. Let me show, um, let me show this picture. So here you can see uh, this is a restricted Boltzmann machine where you, know, you don't allow connections between the green dots and you don't allow connections between the magenta dots. But, but in PBITS, we don't have such a restriction. 
we can have any connections anywhere, which makes the network more powerful, but we limit one important thing. We can't be all to all. So in this case, Boltzmann machine is typically all to all because it was developed by people like Jeff Hinton and they're not hardware people. And they're like, give me all to all, right? I mean, why not? But, in, as, but as you start building stuff from the ground up in FPGAs or with MTJs, you worry about wires and then you worry about uh, connections. So that's why we like sparse connections. So they are very related, but some serious architectural differences exist. Very good, very good uh, uh, stuff. Thank you guys. Thank you all of you. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, let's thank our speaker again. So, Karen, so this is a really wonderful talk, and uh, we have thank very you. warm discussion here. And also, uh, thank everyone to attend our this week seminar talk, and uh, see you next week. Okay, Karen, okay. thank you very much again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.